Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas, the morning edition. Thanks for tuning in this morning. You know, I like carburetors. They're simple. They're easy to work with. Well, heck, we've been working with them for so long that they've become second nature to most of us car people. But you know what? They don't work as well as a good fuel injection system. Now, many people think fuel injection is something that came about with emission laws and things that happened ooh, in the 1970s and 80s and forward. But, you know, fuel injection has been around since the early 1900s. The first system was developed for aircraft use in 1902, but, you know, it had to work on diesel engines too. And Bosch and Classy Cummins decided to produce a system that got rid of Rudolph Diesel's cumbersome air blast system to operate diesel engines. So it's been around for 100 plus years, but the car community was late to embrace it. Now, Mercedes did quite well with it in the early 50s and dominated at Le Mans with fuel injection. Unfortunately, a, an untimely accident ended their Le Mans careers at that time, but their 300 SL with the fuel-injected six-cylinder engine was a monster back in the day. And they were probably one of the first ones that used fuel injection on a regular production car engine. Hi, Rod Olson. How are you doing this morning? All right, so an early use of indirect gasoline injection dates back to 102 when French aviator Leon Levasseur, I can't pronounce it, French name, I'm sorry, but he started using it on a on the first mass-produced V8 engine, and it wasn't in a car, it was in an airplane, so that's where it came about. Now, direct injection came about when the Hesselman engine, invented by a Swedish engine designer, Jonas Hesselman, in 1925, he created an ultra-lean burn principle, fuel injection, uh, to this end is what we're using basically today. Now, all of these systems were mechanical fuel injection. They used a pump that pressurized the fuel, sent it through an injector. It's simply stated it's a spring-loaded ball and piece that under a certain amount of pressure will release the fuel. Today, we no longer use that type. We use electronic fuel injection where the fuel injectors are electrically timed. And the benefit of the electrically timed is that the fuel is injected about the same time the valve opens. Now, what happened pre prior to this is the injection would come on and just send out a mist. A lot of that fuel would get burnt on the hot intake valve. It would create carbon. Now, carbon on valves is not a good thing when it builds up and it blocks the flow of fuel and air. So there were machines made to blast that carbon off the valves. And this is because, of, again, the timing wasn't there. The injectors were not timed to coincide with when the fuel would be going in the cylinders. So they came up with different systems. Now, Daimler-Benz, BMW 801, and a number of other German vehicles used direct Fuel injection. Now, direct fuel injection is a little bit different as it doesn't go through the intake valve. Now, Rolls-Royce Merlin, on their aircraft engines, used the fuel injection. They called it pressure carburetors. Due to the wartime relations between Germany and Japan and Mitsubishi, also had two radial aircraft engines that used fuel injection. The Mitsubishi Kinsei, or Kensai, means uh, Venus, and the Mitsubishi Kasai, which means Mars. Now, I have no idea what that had to do with fuel injection, but that is what they named them. Now, diesel engines were more accepting of fuel injection. As a matter of fact, they needed it because of their ultra-high compression. So diesel engines were the first to get fuel injection, and it was considered normal. And mechanics working on them didn't think anything of it. It was the car engines where fuel injection became black art. And in many cases, especially on Corvettes of the 60s, those fuel injection systems were taken off because they were deemed confusing and complicated. Good morning, Johnny and Bobby Z. 
Johnny Martinez and I are going to be taking off in a little bit. We're going to do some, it's going to be a road trip. Oh, look out, Ventura. Here we come. Anyway, the first automotive direct injection system was developed by Bosch and introduced by Goliath for their Goliath GP700 automobile. You ever heard of the Goliath? Yeah, me neither. Well, actually, I did, but it's been long gone. Now, you found these in 1950s. Now, these were production cars for the 1950s. It was a lubricated high-pressure system and governed by vacuum and intake throttle valve. Now, this is the system similar to what's being used on diesels. The system used on a normal gasoline requires a mechanically driven injection pump. Now, this is the mechanical fuel injection, not the electronic like we're used to seeing today. And it was used on the 55 Mercedes 300 SLRs, like I said. Sterling Moss drove it to victory in the 1955 Mille Magilia. And uh, another driver did not do so well and caused that major accident at Le Mans in 1955. Now, Chevrolet introduced, as I said, the mechanical fuel injection option for the Corvettes. And it was the General Motors Rochester product division that did it. Now it's for the 283 V8 engine. 1956 was the first year it came out. It was a 1957 model. The system directed the inducted engine air across a uh, spoon shape, they said, plunger that moved in proportion to air volume. But it was a mechanical system again, not electronically controlled, so it was not quite as precise. But it worked excellent when it was set right. And uh, it created a lot of horsepower and better fuel economy. In the days of the early fuel injection, I've been told some of those early Corvettes were getting over 20 miles per gallon. Good morning, Natalie. How are you doing this morning? So in 1956, Lucas developed its own fuel injection system and used for Jaguars for racing at Le Mans. Now, Lucas is an electric company. You know, Prince of Darkness. Yeah, they provide the electronics for many British automobiles. But their injection system was good. It worked well. The system was subsequently adopted very successfully in Formula One racing. And it secured championships for Cooper, BRM, Lotus, Brabham, Matra, Terrell for many years. 1959 through 1973, that Lucas injection was the performance thing to go to for Formula One racing. Now, during the 60s, mechanical fuel injection systems such as Hillborn, uh, American companies here, this was for racing purposes. They were used on modified V8 engines in sprint car racing and in drag racing, and they were the setup. Now, you saw many different types with long tubes, short tubes, different shape tubes, different angle tubes, all to get the air to flow in better. They used one tube per cylinder. Unlike what we have today, where it's one air valve that lets the air in, or metering valve, or throttle body, as they call them. In 1967, Jap Jap one of the Japanese manufacturers, Tahatsu, started using mechanical fuel injection on their cars. Now, I had a 1972 BMW, a 2002 TII and it had mechanical fuel injection. The standard 2002 with a 2-liter V8 engine, or V8 engine, 4-cylinder engine and carburetor produced about 100 horsepower. The fuel injection version produced 125 horsepower. And in Europe, the fuel-injected engine, the TII, was mated to a turbocharger. And that was a quick car. As a matter of fact, that car was so quick and so fast for the time they actually put a sticker across the bumper or the spoiler in the front and the top of the windshield with the word turbo spelled backwards. Because when you looked at it through your mirror, the car was coming up behind you, you saw the word turbo in the correct order it was spelled, and you moved out of its way. Well, that was the theory anyway. Electronic fuel injections become the way of to go. And you can get many kits now to put on your cars. Now, again, the Chevrolet was not the only mechanically fuel-injected car, and a lot of people don't remember or know this, but Pontiac had their version of the Rochester fuel injection as well on the Bonneville in 1958. 
Not many people knew about it. Not many people bought it. Chevrolet put fuel injection on full-size Chevy sedans in 1959. Again, no one talks about that. They weren't really popular. It was considered black magic. And a lot of people did not understand it. It was quite simple. But because they didn't understand it, they didn't use it. Many Corvettes had the fuel injection system taken off and replaced by carburetors. Only to find out later on that the, that was what was wanted. And that was the cool setup. And people are retrofitting and trying to find those fuel injection systems for their cars to bring them back to stock condition. Now, the first commercial electronic fuel injection system was the Electrojector, mm -hmm. developed by Bendix and was offered by American Motors, AMC, Rambler. Who would have thought? And it was on the Rambler Rebel in 1957. It was used to promote AMC's new 327 cubic inch V8. The electro injector was an option and rated at 288 horsepower. The EFI uh, produced peak torque of fi at 500 RPM. Now, another company that tried fuel injection was Chrysler. But Chrysler's system, very complicated, did not work. They ended up pulling it off customers' cars and putting carburetors in its place. Strange situation. But they couldn't figure out what the problems were. And again, this was early electronics. They didn't have the computer systems that we have today. And Chrysler offered theirs, like I said, 1958 on the 300D to Soto Avenger and the Dodge D500. These were considered performance cars of the time. We call them muscle cars, but... Uh, it was an early fuel injection system, and it was developed by Bendix. It was so bad, all 35 vehicles that they put it on, they removed it. 35, only 35 vehicles. Hi, Jess. How are you doing? Jessica Lundgren, all the way from way over there. How's the weather? I understand you were having some cool, rainy weather last week. Hope it's cleared up for you. Now, Bosch developed an electronic fuel injection system called the D-Jetronic. D for duck or druck. German for pressure. And it was uh, used on VWs, Mercedes, Porsche, Citroën, Saab, Volvo, and licensed the Jaguar. So they used it. The G the Jetronic form before switching to the L Jetronic in 78. And they did that on the Jag XK6. Bosch superseded the D Jetronic with the K Jetronic and the L Jetronic. And I remember the L-Jetronic on BMWs back in the day. In Japan, the Toyota Celica used an electronic fuel injection, a multi-point. And there's where we started getting some better fuel injection systems. The Japanese and the Americans and the Europeans started working because they also found out that the injection helped them meet emissions and get better fuel mileage and more horsepower. Look at the cars today. Yes, Jessica, I, I know it's Sweden. I, I, I do forget sometimes. But uh, nice and warm there? Good. That's great. It's nice and warm here, too. It's actually toasty here, even here at the mm -hmm. beach. Someone trying to call in in the middle of this. Huh, the rudeness of them all. All right. Nowadays, fuel injection is pretty much the standard way. Buying a new car with carburetor is impossible. There aren't any. They use multi-point injection in 99% of the cars that are out there. Now, for hot rodders, retrofitting fuel injection to your old car has become quite simple and relatively inexpensive. For less than $1,000, you can get one from Fitec. It replaces the carburetor. It's a throttle body system, not a multi-point system. So, again, it is backwards in comparison to what fuel injection has become. When we first started getting fuel injection on American cars, electronic fuel injection, Cadillac and General Motors pioneered the throttle body. It was a simple system, computer controlled, two injectors sitting in a throttle body that resembled a carburetor, basically. And it's metered the fuel through the venturis of the carburetor or the throttle body. It was somewhat reliable. It was somewhat better than a carburetor. And it's still, again, the computer systems of the time were not really as advanced as they are today. They did work. It did do the job necessary for the time. But General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, everyone moved on to a multi-point injection system where there was one injection per cylinder, whether it was a, a four-cylinder, six-cylinder, or eight-cylinder. 
or in case of Chevrolet, five cylinder. Yeah, they had a five cylinder inline motor in the Colorado and the Canyon. Now, what they found, as I talked about earlier, was the injectors were not timed. So it was based on pressures. It was based on, okay, we're rotating, we're sequencing. We're just sequentially sending out the fuel. It would burn on the valve, causing carbon. And when I worked for one of the Japanese companies, we actually had to buy a special equipment, a special tool that would blast the carbon off the valves because it created carbon buildup that, that created drivability issues, higher emissions, and poor fuel economy. It shot crushed walnut shells onto the valve, basically knocking off the carbon and polishing the valve stem. Now, one of the things that BMW, who also had the, the problem, did was they put in their owner's manual, if you did not use Chevron fuel with Tektron, that's their additive, then they would not clean the valves again. Apparently, the Tektron additive that they were using at Chevron was advanced enough to clean the valves, even though the injectors were still squirting on a hot valve. To fix this, they went to timed injection so that the injectors squirt at the time the valve is opening. More power, better economy, better emissions, and it worked without creating the carbon buildup. Yes, Robert, walnut shells. What did I say? I thought I said walnut shells, Robert. Crushed walnut shells is what it would shoot out. Now, this machine was not developed for cars with fuel injection. It originally came out in 1950 because Oldsmobile's Rocket V8, the 303, had the same problem with carburation. So this machine was developed by a company called Kent Moore, which was the special tool manufacturer for General Motors, BMW, Nissan, and a host of others, to knock the carbon off the valves. It was called the Carbon Blaster. And they tried rice at first, Robert. The problem was in the high humidity areas, it would puff up the rice. It would actually cook the rice as they were doing, as they were shooting it through the engine. So they went to the walnut shells. It was less abrasive. It worked. It polished the valve stems. And it wasn't affected as much by the weather. So fuel injection is the way to go. You can put it on your cars today. You can change your carbureted system to a fuel injection system relatively inexpensively and improve performance and fuel economy. I've got fuel injection on our 1956 Chevrolet. As a matter of fact, the photo in my previous post shows the Corvette L98 engine in our 56 Chevrolet with Chevrolet's first multi-point fuel injection system, electronically controlled. Came out in the Corvettes in 1985 and uh, worked quite well. And I get 25 miles per gallon on the highway with our 1956 Chevrolet, my Corvette, about the same range, different gear ratios though, so that's why the engine runs a little bit higher in RPM and gets a little bit less fuel mileage, although I've gotten as high as 28 miles per gallon on our Corvette, just cruising down the highway at a steady state about 65 to 70 miles an hour. So fuel injection is quite efficient, it works well, you're not going to find a carbureted engine from a manufacturer any longer in a production car, it just doesn't work as well. Fuel injection even works well on Harley-Davidson's. They've switched over to that on their bikes. Bikes fire up right away. Better fuel mileage, better performance, smoother running. You're not sitting there kicking it, trying to get that carburetor to work without enough vacuum to suck the fuel out. I'm Hot Rod Bob. Fuel injection. We all have it now. Pretty much on everything we drive. You guys have a great day. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas. The morning edition. I'm going to head over to Johnny Martinez's right now. We're going to go cruising. we got some business to take care of. Take care, folks. Have a great day. And keep watching gas, the great American auto scene. You can see it on YouTube. You can hear it on Anchor FM, Apple iTunes, and a host of other places. Search. You shall seek and find. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas. The morning edition. Brought to you by Service Tech. Yes, the guys that provide the equipment you need to service your vehicles in your shop, whether it's your home shop or your business shop. They're basically commercial-based, but hey, guys, I got their stuff in my home garage. It works. You take care now. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas. Part of Two Tired Guys Productions. Talk to you later.